Good evening. I'd like to uh, call to order the open session for our meeting tonight at 6.35. There was no public comment for items in our closed session. And we adjourned our closed session and we now convening our open session. And we did not take any action during the So there's nothing to report out. And tonight we have uh, the Pledge of Allegiance and it will be done by our graduating members of dual immersion Spanish cohort. Dr. Giroux, introduce please. Good evening, Board President Golar, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, cabinet members, and members of the community. It's my pleasure to welcome two of our graduating seniors who are part of the first cohort of Spanish dual immersion students, Ava Sheckman and Malena Robertson. Please stand. Put your right hands over your heart. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you. It was over 12 years ago that the first dual immersion program was launched in our district. In the fall of 2010, the first group of students enrolled in Monroe's, at that time, new Spanish dual immersion program. Leading the way is not easy. It took a great deal of commitment, dedication, and courage from the students, the teachers, and the parents to maintain their successful path. Tonight, we acknowledge a significant milestone as we celebrate these trailblazing students who will be graduating this spring. Before we call up these students, I wanna recognize the commitment and support from the parents and families and our amazing group of teachers and staff who make up our DI programs a success. Well, we'll call up our students from the first Spanish dual immersion cohort. Abigail Miranda. <laughs> Alina Torres. <laughs> Amanda Tovar. <laughs> Anthony Arnott. <laughs> Ava Sheckman. Bianca Zeramar. <laughs> Emily Diaz. <laughs> Helen Zavala. <laughs> Jacob Steiner. Jane Newman. <laughs> Jessica Hernandez. <laughs> Jonathan Camargo. <laughs> Jonathan Castaneda. <laughs> Jordan Smith. Jocelyn Sandoval. <laughs> Robert DeBetta. <laughs> Malena Robertson. <laughs> Z 
Zachary Smith. I present to you our first cohort of graduating dual immersion students. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Giroux, and congratulations to each of our graduates. We'd like to take a picture with you, don't leave. We would like to take a picture with you if possible. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I can see there. She's on her lunch break from work. Oh, so she just said, I, I coached Zach in basketball when he was a little guy. As we return to our seats, I think it's important to acknowledge that one of the persons in our picture is Ms. Cindy Lathrop, the former principal at Monroe. So thank you for coming out tonight and recognizing your children too. Roll call. All are present and we have been beamed in to our meeting, Mr. Rob Hammond. So all are present tonight. And, oh, there it is on the agenda. No report out in closed session. Okay. We're at order of business. You guys can hear me, right? Madam President, if I may. Uh, give me one second. You maybe you can't hear me. Yeah, we're we're waiting for our transition. We're almost there. Okay. The board agenda discussion and presentation items, which could include input from representatives of agendized matters, may be moved on the agenda. Um, I'm going to ask if there are any changes or is there movement on our agenda? If, if, if I may, um, I know Mr. Hammond wants to jump in, but administratively there is one okay. that I would like to bring to the board's attention. Okay. Under recognitions and communications, item number one, uh, recognizing uh, a 2023 young legislator, uh, we will not be doing that this evening. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Hammond? Uh, Madam President, if I may, I, I have a comment to make. It's regarding item number 22-23-5060. In the past, I have worked in 1996 with the dedication of the Vietnam Memorial, honoring nine Monrovians who gave their lives in Vietnam. 
I was involved in naming the library at Monrovia High School after Mr. Frank Jensen, and recently naming the foyer at the district office for Mimi Mincy. All three of these have something in common, and it's that many, many years had passed before recognition was given. And as time moves on, less people know the impact that these people have had. The question on 2020-23-5060 is, why Betty Sanford? For decades, Betty used her amazing skills to raise up people who were forgotten or ignored. She was a champion of the underdog, and more importantly, she was a champion of our students. She gave freely of her time, treasure, and talents for decades. The process that we have is in naming a building requires the board to go through the public meeting process. This means the board has no discussion about the item for or against until it is posted on the agenda and discussed in public. Why the Louise K. Taylor Performing Arts Center? MUSD does not have a lot of buildings. The theater in Monrovia High School is a focal point of our community and campus and fitting of this honor. Would Dr. Taylor be displaced? No. Board policy states a perpetual monument would be created that many people who have made significant contributions in the past, present, and future would share in the honor of such a prestigious honor. Think of it as an honor roll of Monrovia heroes in perpetuity. Things have changed since I asked for the item to be put on the agenda. Namely, there is information today that was not known when the agenda was prepared. That information is moving forward, would not be in keeping with the wishes of the Sanford family. Consequently, no matter how well-intentioned this matter is, I do not think we should proceed with this item, and I ask the board to please consider pulling the item from consideration. So to clarify, thank you um, for your comments. The exact motion is? That we pull item 22 slash 23 dash 5060. Any other discussion? Um, I think um, it's important for the community to hear where we stand on this. I think we should move it and vote on it. Okay. So we have a motion. Is there a second? I'm sorry. Is there a second to that motion? I should have asked that before I asked for a discussion. Sorry. I thought it was a, um, whether there was a consensus to pull the item from the, so. Yes, that's the motion. Right, that's are you my, I'm in agreement with that. Okay, now discussion, you had a comment. And are there other comments? Um, I do have just a, a brief comment. Um, again, thank you for entertaining that motion for us. I think it's important for us to recognize that we are more than simply school board members. We are governing trustees. And in that light, we are imparted to uphold the trust of first and foremost, what is good for our students, our staff who work for our district, our parents who are associated with those students, and then the community at large. Those are those who have voted us onto this governing board and those who, thank you, pass the bond. So we are beholding to the trust as trustees. And I believe that what you have motioned would be in agreement with maintaining that trust. So that is my comment. Further discussion? I'm having difficulty understanding the um, point of order of 
what is happening at this moment because where we are is order of business and I understand that is are we moving anything yes or are we not moving anything that's the motion and on the there floor. have been some more than more than discussions about moving it or not um, so there's some point of order that is confusing and and convoluted for me because there have been some 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 speeches made that don't fall into whether or not we're moving this or whether or not we're pulling it so I would like to stay to um, specifically to the motion which is to pull it or to not to pull it so there has been a motion made as I understand it and a second has there been a second I thought I'd heard a second if I may President Golar this is uh, if we're pulling the item it is no longer an action item therefore not requiring a vote we are not motioning and we're not voting but there needs to be a consensus okay I understand of pulling that item and so I'm in agreement with pulling the item. I, that's okay. what my, my statement was. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarification. So we have, a, I guess, a thumbs up or down, or I can live with it sideways in terms of consensus vote. Are we clear? We got a thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. I think that the um, public has a right to hear all of our opinions on this matter and um, so uh, I, I would like the public to hear what the board has to say because we represent the board uh, we represent the public and I think the public that I see here in this boardroom more than I have seen in a while wants to know what the board thinks and I think we owe it to the public to let them know what the all of the board thinks about this item so thumbs down on pulling it okay so four two one and for point of clarification for those who have joined us this evening it does not take away your right for public comment so just point of clarification there and we will proceed okay we are now going to approve the minutes of the regular board of education meeting that was scheduled back on april the 26th 2023 motion for approval of business of meetings so moved second any discussion or question okay we can call that to a vote board member Lockerbie yes board member Trevanti yes board member Hammond abstain you say it board yeah. member Anderson Absent. yes board president Golar yes motion carries four and one abstention okay we're now to recognitions and communications. We are ready for the Monrovia Elementary Olympic team winners. And again, we have Dr. Jarrell yes. and Dr. Rodas. Thank you. Good evening again, Board President Golar, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, members of the cabinet, members of the community. April 28th marked the return of the Monrovia Elementary Olympics, or the MEOs, a an important tradition that started over 15 years ago. And this year's event did not disappoint with amazing displays of teamwork, sportsmanship, athleticism, and school spirit. In addition to the many medals that are awarded to the MEO athletes, there are two very special team awards that are presented. The championship trophy, which is given to the school that earns the highest point total from all the events, and the spirit stick, which is awarded to the school that displays the highest level of school spirit and sportsmanship. This year's MEO championship trophy was awarded to the Mayflower Mariners. Congratulations. 
Can get some representatives from Mayflower. I got my steps in hanging up this one. Yeah. We have our principal and Custerelli, we're doing that do, uh, accepting oh, yeah. on behalf of accepting on behalf of all of the uh, athletes at Mariners. That's right. And joining them, the Spirit Stick. Uh, this year's Spirit Stick was awarded to the Plymouth Dragons. Woo! There it is. And they, they have the stick. And they brought the actual Spirit Stick with them. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. There was so much spirit. That's right. Yeah. Well, we'll come forward and take pictures with our winners. Thank you. Dr. Smith, I do have a, a slight request, kind of a, if we could have at some point some of the institutional memory recorded as to when the, what it, the whole name, M-E-O's, when they began, because I have a thought in my brain, I somehow remember a Dana Elliott having Absolutely. a lot to do with the inception. Of, and I don't want to mistake, but that's what my memory tells me, right? So I, I think, correct. one, to really have that recorded knowledge in history so we don't lose it, <laughs> right? Yeah, but the viewing public and those who currently are new to our district may not have that history, right? And so we started tonight's meeting <laughs> on trying to make sure that we capture and maintain that rich history. And I think I had a different, another point, but I don't remember it now. <laughs> Do, would you like uh, Dr. Giroux to share a little bit about that or? Well, I don't want to put him on the spot. He didn't know, so I'm not going to, Dr. Giroux, would you knows. like to uh, share a brief it, uh, MEO historical it. lesson? It, it's going to be brief because I don't have all the details, but I can confirm that Dana Elliott, she started this, it was over 15 years ago because this was the 15th MEOs and we missed a, a few of them. Um, I don't know how she did it as a classroom teacher, but she also was instrumental in helping us bring it back this year from Kentucky. She Zoomed with us. She came by once, I think, to help locate some items. So she's been, st continues to be just an important part of it. So yeah, she was amazing. Well, thank you. I, I, again, I was not trying to put anyone on the spot in that sense, but I did not want to misspeak, but wanted to capture that memory and honor someone who, who dedicated a lot to having this come to our district, and now we're able to go back to it because we can do stuff in person now. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll be point of order. I'll go back to the script.
Uh, we are now at board member reports, and um, we'll go with Ms. Lockerbie, please. We Thank you, some... Madam President. Is that all right with you, Ms. Becerra? Thank you. Oh, I just want to make sure. Yeah. Oh, so she, yeah, just the order. It's fine. Thank you. So I was delighted to be able to tour the MHS cafeteria last week with Drs. Smith and Francois, Ms. Garcia, Anthony Parada, and Principal Ayala. I was able to see how lunch flows at MHS, look at the food, smell the food, observe what our students are eating, and see how efficiently the staff gets all of the kids their food. Ms. Garcia even timed the line and saw that the, did you, how, was it three minutes? It was less than three minutes that a huge uh, mass of, of high school kids got through the line in the cafeteria. It was so fast. I also saw the satellite food stations around the campus, which helped to expedite getting all the foods, uh, all the kids, their food. I want to say a special thank you to Alicia Escobar um, in the, in the um, food service department at the, at the high school, who took the time to talk to me about the process, about the food, about the laws, and there are laws about that. She said, every child that comes to me has to have a fruit and a vegetable in their hand so they can't just come up and take a piece of pizza or a corn dog or a cookie or something like that. They have to have a balanced meal, and that was so um, poignant um, for me to hear, and I so appreciate that she took the time to talk about those spe specific things with me. And she showed me pictures of her setup. She seemed very um, happy to see me there and, and to be able to share the experience with me. Uh, so it was all of the nuts and bolts that can't be fully appreciated without actually being there. It's important to me to be able to see and experience the workings of our school district and I want to be, uh, express my thanks for giving me that time to do that. While there, I also visited the high school garden. It's a surprisingly large space, which is currently being used by the environmental science classes taught by Ms. Wedgworth, as well as our special ed classes, what a great opportunity for both of those classes. Two years ago, I attended a session at the CSBA conference on addressing climate change and the impact it has on schools. They suggested roles which locally elected boards could take and districts could adopt, including teaching our students to be responsible stewards of our environment, modeling climate-friendly behavior, advocating for energy-efficient buildings, creating conditions to walk and bike to school, eating good foods, every school having a garden, main district kitchen having a farm, composting and installing solar. The MHS garden could be improved upon and utilized also by the wellness center, robotics, the drone club, a used shipping container or a portable classroom could be placed and converted into a mushroom farm or a chicken coop, garden equipment storage, or an on-site classroom center for all of our students to use as a project-based learning center, a space truly worthy of perhaps naming for a beloved community member. Climate change matters because the negative effects of it can cause school closures. From 2002 to 2018, California public schools have reported approximately 34,000 days lost. Next slide, please. 
lost two emergency closures. You can see on the slide, the orange represents wildfires. In school year 2017-2018, next slide please, 972,000 students were impacted by Southern California fires. In 1819, 1 1.2 million students were impacted. This data doesn't include the fires that we had here above Monrovia in 2020, which closed our schools for three days. This final slide, next slide please, shows the fire damage acreage in California corresponding with temperatures ranging from 1972 to 2018. And all of those three slides are from the CSB conference that I mentioned beforehand. I hope this information will impress upon all of us the necessity of improving and expanding our MHS gardens and of having solar panels throughout the campuses as a way to increase shade, provide shelter from the rain for our students and staff, create renewable lighting and clean lighting, conserve energy, and do our part to help mitigate climate change. That ends my board report. Thank you. Ms. Trevanti. Thank you, President Golar. Uh, first, I want to say Feliz Dia de las Madres um, in Mexico. May 10th uh, every year is Mother's Day. Um, and so um, I get to celebrate too, Mother's Day, <laughs> twice. Uh, but wishing everybody a uh, happy Mother's Day um, today and celebrating on Sunday. Uh, my first report is on Arbor Day, which was not this past Saturday, the previous Saturday, and there were a lot of activities that were going on throughout the community. Um, one, um, one event I was at was the Arbor Day celebration at Monrovia High School, uh, put on by uh, Claire Robinson with Amigos de los Rios, and we planted a bunch of trees, and it was just a great event. We had a lot of volunteers. It was really nice to see. Um, the city did provide the replacement oak trees along uh, Colorado, so those were uh, re those were removed. I want to say two years ago now. It's is it closer to three? Uh, those were removed when they did the sidewalk expansion. So I'm really happy to see that those trees are back planted and will be cared for by the city um, and they will grow into nice shade trees along Colorado. Also some new legacy oak trees were planted and they will sometimes, some years from now, will become shade trees as well. Um, and they did a lot of mulching and taking care of our big legacy trees in front of the high school. So that's just the beginning of a much larger project, but it was really great to see. And yes, yours truly picked up a shovel and was digging too, along with the other. So it was a great event. Um, I know uh, President Golar was at one of our schools on the same day. So if he wanted to talk about that event. I don't know if you have that slide, um, but while you guys were working at MHS, we were working at Wild there World. And so there were two organizations that partnered with our community partner, Food Ed, and that was uh, the Baha'is of Monrovia. In addition, um, there were a group of volunteers from Southern California Edison. And we too planted trees along the interior of the campus and then along the fence area of heliotrope. So. There were two, and then I think there was an actual third project at Clifton. Yes. But I didn't, after raking the. It was a little physical. Preparing right? the ground for the mulch, <laughs> um, I was done. Uh, it was a very hot day. That happened to be one of those 80 degree weather days in Monrovia. The gorgeous day. But a lot of good work and uh, a lot of vol volunteerism in terms of coming out and, and supporting Wild Rose. Yep. So thank you. All right, wonderful. The other part of my report is to talk about a really great event that happened last Monday, and that was the Feminier Summit at Santa Fe um, Computer Magnet School. And it was just a wonderful event. 
And this is the culmination of a year's worth of students learning about coding, programming, building projects, and um, showing them off last Monday night. And we had a great crowd, uh, just some really creative projects out there. Um, you know, they had their laptops out and they can actually control the movement of each one of these projects. So I do want to thank uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Francois for bringing this curriculum, Feminier's curriculum, to the board. I believe it was late last spring. And thank you, board, for adopting the Feminier's because it's a wonderful program and it's really going to jumpstart this enthusiasm um, for STEM. And they're going to matriculate from the elementary schools to the middle schools and then on to our new engineering program at the high school and all the other programs that we offer there. So uh, just a great event and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one already. So thank you. And that concludes my report. Thank you. And now Ms. Anderson. I should turn on my mic, I guess. Um, we probably all have the same May calendar that is just overflowing <laughs> with um, <laughs> events and opportunities. And the upside of that is there's so many amazing things to see in Monrovia. And I, I, it's, it's just one more example here of the dedicated staff that has gone to put together um, this first annual, I've, I'm told is called the inaugural Community Resource Fair on May the 4th Be With You. So it was Star Wars theme, themed. This was an event that not only was a lot of fun, uh, we had food trucks and scavenger hunts and DJ Todd playing uh, Star Wars music and raffles and things. But it was really a, a partnership with our community members um, that were there on hand to um, offer uh, additional opportunities like um, mental health resources, uh, resources for students with disabilities, job resources, and community services. Um, there are also post-secondary um, educational opportunities as well. So there was there was a whole variety of things, um, and it was it was a really fantastic event. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes next year, but it, it really, to underscore all of it, this partnership that we have with um, our community, and, and there are so many of them, it's such a rich partnership with so many entities that we have in Monrovia for our students, and that's um, not only very meaningful, but I, I can't just, I can't wait to see how it flourishes um, even further to, to greater benefit our students in the future. Um, and then right after that, I in fact left that to to go to Greece. It was a it was a double header kind of evening, and uh, several of us attended Greece, the middle schools musical um, held at Clifton Auditorium. Um, it was a really proud moment to see all those kids talk about um, happy and proud. This was not only a happy and proud moment for our kids based on the smiles and, and enthusiasm uh, as they were performing, um, but happy and proud, I think I can speak for all of us. It was, it was really fantastic. It was a lot of fun. Um, we had both middle schools performing and both of our middle school principals were there on hand to introduce um, the the students and so I really um, applaud the collaboration of bringing both middle schools together on this uh, given that only one middle school has an auditorium it was um, you know it was a there was a little bit of strategic maneuvering to make that happen and so I applaud not only um, the the time and effort and the thought behind that but also the opportunity for our students from both middle schools to get to know each other as they get ready to become future wildcats anyway so um that ends my report thank you and i think there's one more this one and this is uh wild rose the school of creative arts and the production of arista cats which was fabulous um, for an elementary school uh, production that basically incorporates TK through fifth grade, including the staff who 
are up front and in the back of the house um, making this happen. So this was spectacular. The attendance, the auditorium at MHS was pretty much packed. Um, and so uh, again, a wonderful time for all. I believe there were two performances, not just that one. Um, and I'm sorry, what date was that? <laughs> Well, thank you, there you go. Um, so, I believe um, in particular the principal, well, she's here, uh, Ms. Page, um, she had a heck of a day, uh, at least on that Saturday's performance, because um, a lot went into being able to put in performance mode that number of students. And I mean, really, it pretty much is the whole school. So. Thank you guys, and I certainly enjoyed myself. And as you can see, a um, little personalization there. That's my little niece who is in, in who's a TKer at at, at uh, Wild Rose. So, so that's that's all I have. Okay, that takes care of our board member reports. And now, do we take do we take all of? Oh, no. Um, I think we took all of your thunder. Sorry, Dr. Smith, but <laughs> that, that you is, can follow us. That Go is on, try. a <laughs> difficult act to follow considering uh, those board reports, especially the last few. Um, so much, so many fantastic things happening around our district. But let me back up. Good evening, President Golar, members of the board, members of our community, uh, teachers, faculty, and staff. Um, when we get to this point of the year, this really is the best time of the year in so many ways because there are so many opportunities to celebrate the incredible things that our students are doing the fantastic work that our teachers and staff are doing and the impact that that has on our community as a whole and through all of the examples that the board shared in some of our earlier presentations with the MEOs and our first graduating cohort of direct or dual immersion students you can see the impact that that work has for the good. And there's so much to be joyous about. And as superintendent, it truly is a privilege to be a part of that work and to work right alongside some of the best professionals I've ever worked with. I do have a few updates that I would like to share um, <clears throat> that kind of go in between. Much of it will be recognition more than anything. Um, but there is an event that stands out in my mind that the board did not touch upon, not because the board um, the board could have got, gone much longer with events. So I, I, it's a pleasure to shine a light on this. Uh, I had the privilege of attending Clifton's spring concert under the direction of Tim Weed, uh, their musical director over there. And it was phenomenal. It was truly a fantastic event. And I thought the winter concert was a fantastic event. I think I said the same thing then, but to see the growth in the students between December and May, it was mind blowing. The beginning band students, they're not beginners anymore. And the advanced uh, students, the orchestra and strings, you know, you can tell they're ready for the next level. I was able to find a short clip, it's two minutes. I really would like the opportunity to play it just so everybody can kind of enjoy what we all that were able to attend enjoyed. Arine?
middle school students, fantastic ones. Um, and so grateful to Mr. Weed, so grateful to our parent group that supports behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, but perhaps most importantly, grateful to the board for supporting the arts in our district. Uh, we make significant contributions to the arts because it's important and it results in, in moments like that. I also want to recognize that in the month of May, there's a lot of celebrating to be done of different employees and employee groups. And this is a group of fantastic principals. And on May 1st, we celebrated National School Principal Day. And Board President Golar mentioned the amount of hours that Principal Ramos puts in, you know, thinking about Aristocats on top of her daily work. All of our principals do the same for various events. And without them, the outcomes that we get for our students wouldn't be possible. So again, my heartfelt appreciation to our principals, wonderful, dedicated educational professionals, and their leadership is so, so appreciated. And I'm so grateful to be working with them each and every day. This week also marks Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, there was a little controversy about around when exactly Teacher Appreciation Week technically was. Um, if you follow social media circles, there was some debate about that. It's technically the first full week of May, uh, and that includes Sunday, which is why it's technically this week, um, and you can double check that. But this is a, an opportunity for us to, again, celebrate our incredible teachers who really do deliver fantastic instruction, fantastic support, and fantastic opportunities outside of the classroom and beyond for all of our students. They are the heart and the soul of our district, and I am so grateful, as I know the Board of Education is, for all that they do each and every day. And yes, indeed, we do love you teachers. I'd also like to recognize that today is School Nurse Day. So School Nurse Day. So this, again, is an opportunity to celebrate the wonderful health professionals that work within our schools and support not just our students, but also our families, our community, as well as our staff members. As you know, the last three years has been pretty challenging, um, pretty challenging time. And these school nurses um, really did go above and beyond the call of duty. And honestly, it's because they care and they care so much about who they serve. And so I'm grateful to our nursing team for all that they do. Madam President, that concludes my superintendent report. Well, thank you. Okay, and now we're at our student board member report. Miss Emma, Dahapitiya. There you go. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Board President Golar, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, Cabinet, and members of the community. I'm happy to be back here with everyone tonight, and there's a lot going on at Monrovia High School. We're in the home stretch, and grad night tickets sales close tomorrow. Graduation is only four weeks away, so I can't believe that. It's definitely a lot. Um, graduation at MHS will take place on Wednesday, June 7th at 5 p.m. at Wildcat Stadium. Seniors will receive eight tickets each for the celebration of our academic journey. MHS hosted the annual Monrovia Elementary Olympics last Friday. It was the first time this event has taken place since 2019, and the kids had a great time competing against each other and embracing the ideas of com com competition and sportsmanship. Prom 2023 took place Saturday, April 29th at the R1 venue in Anaheim. Over 450 students attended this event and it was a tremendous success. Renaissance has begun their sign on the line senior recognition during lunch. This is an opportunity for seniors who have made a commitment to continue their educational journey to be celebrated. We celebrate community colleges, trade schools, the military, and of course, four-year college attendees. AP test season is also upon us. The exams began Monday, May 1st, and will wrap up this coming Friday. State testing, also known as the SBAC, will be taking place the following two weeks. Um, starting next Monday, May 15th, through Friday, May 19th, when Urban High School is having Be Kind to Your Mind Week. Um, Monday, we will have positive note cards and candy for students during lunch. And Wednesday, there will be therapy dogs in the Wellness Center. So that'll be fun to go and visit them. And on Friday, it'll be a spirit day to dress as an emotion similar to the movie Inside Out. Yeah. I know, such a cute. And then um, 
Finally, like Superintendent Smith said, this week is Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, at MHS, we believe that every adult on campus is a teacher, regardless of their role. And on behalf of the associate student body, I would like to publicly thank each of them for their commitment to our students, our community, and the Wildcat way. Thank you for listening to my reports. Thank you. So, oh, oh, nah, can't talk tonight. Um, so appropriate that you would end with recognizing the adults in the building in which you will be graduating from uh, MHS this graduation ceremony time. And we want to honor and recognize you um, for your year of service here as our student board representative. So I have a plaque from us to you, and it says, Monrovia Unified School District with great appreciation to Emma Nahapetian, who served as student board member, Monrovia Unified School District Board of Education, September 2022 to June 2023. So we have a plaque, and we're going to meet you in the front because we'll take a picture, our final picture with you. We are now at um, public comments. The Board of Education encourages public participation. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Keep in touch, let us know what's going on. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. Good night. Okay. I'll repeat that again. The Board of Education encourages public participation and invites you to share your views on school business. Please complete the addressing the Board of Education form and give it to uh, the Secretary of the Board, the Superintendent, or designee, Ms. Becerra, prior to the start of our meeting. In order to accomplish school business in a timely and efficient manner, public input is limited to no more than three minutes per person per agenda or non-agenda item, totally no more than 20 minutes per item. First, our public comments for items not on the agenda. In compliance with the Brown Act, items not on the agenda legally cannot be discussed by the board tonight. We welcome your input, but are limited to asking clarifying questions and gathering contact information. Items requiring board discussion or action will have to be calendared for a future meeting so that all interested parties may provide input. And Ms. Becerra, do we have public comment for items not on the agenda? There is one. I'd like to invite Tremal Radcliffe to the podium. I don't want to waste any paper. <laughs> Good evening, Superintendent Ryan Smith, Board President Tracy Goller, Board Vice President Jennifer Anderson, Board Member Maritza Travanti, Board Member Celine Lockerbie, Board Clerk Rob Hammond and Cabinet, and Student Representative. Uh, my name is Tremel Ratcliffe, and I am a field representative for an organization called Just Us for Youth. Justice for Youth is a uh, mentoring and restorative justice a uh, nonprofit organization that serves at promise, not at risk, but at promise youth in their communities to develop as scholars, people, and leaders. Justice Fuf is committed to providing quality interventions and restorative practices to improve student social emotional health, educational performance, and positive behaviors. Justice Fuf is based out of the city of Pomona, but we serve across multiple counties, including LA County. Not only do we provide um, direct services to school districts and school sites through our uh, programs, but we also provide uh, violence prevention and intervention on behalf of County Supervisor Hilda Solis's office, District 1. Uh, we would love to meet with the Monrovia Unified School District to um, simply share, about, share more about our programs and possibly collaborate and partner with you all um, to serve the needs of the students and their community. Um, I want to just end off by, you know, thank you all for your, you know, your, your hard work and dedication to this district and the many teachers and staff that support the district as well. Um, and, you know, like this is, like they mentioned today, teacher appreciation and, you know, all staff appreciation. Um, this is what makes uh, a great district and, you know, really continue to inspire our students. And we believe that uh, many students um, can benefit from a mentor. Um, you know, I once grew up and, you know, went through public school as well, and I benefited highly from a mentor, just being able to help guide me down the right path and really help me to figure out what I wanted to do after I graduated high school as well. So I want to just end off by mentioning that and just, you know, sharing about the importance of uh, a mentor and really, um, you know, satisfying that social emotional piece for uh, students and their communities. Thank you so much. And have a great evening. Thank you for your comment, and we have the contact information, Ms. Becerra, for this gentleman. Yes, we do. Excellent. Are there other comments for items not on our agenda? There are none. Okay. And So you are correct. And so now that that agenda item that was printed, but then by consensus vote withdrawn, you would be able to 
publicly comment on items not on the agenda. So now would be the appropriate time. One moment, though, President Golar. Uh, Ma'am, did you submit a I comment did. card? Yeah, she said she did. So we have an order that we'll call them in. So Ms. Becerra. First, I'd like to call Karen K. Suarez to the podium. <laughs> Thank you, um, President Golar, um, Superintendent, and other volunteer board members. Thank you for your time, and thank you for bringing your reusable bottles. i kind of discouraged to see um, the disposable plastic on the table. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak about the item that was on the agenda and polled about renaming the Performing Arts Center um, from Dr. Louise Taylor. Uh, to the Betty Sanford. Um, I am just really discouraged to see that this was even entertained. Uh, Dr. Taylor was such an advocate for the performing arts and the arts in general for 19 years here um, at the school, and she's beloved in the community and uh, very deserving of having her name on this and it was voted on and it could be revoted on and I think that it's fine if people want to bring up a name change or propose a name um, I am also a huge fan of Betty Sanford she never said no she contributed so much to this community she is very deserving to have something from um, the high school or the schools in general uh, named in her honor. So I welcome that. Um, good to see you, Rob. Are you in Montana again up there? <laughs> uh, but just uh, curious to see, you know, the rationale to remove, um, you know, why this came up to remove Dr. Uh, Taylor from uh, having the building named after her. I mean, that that's just, you know. But I do think that there are alive people, you know, that can make mistakes. <laughs> and you might want to change a name for something at some point. So I'm in full agreement that it could, you know, anything named after somebody can come up and um, maybe um, have somebody present and prominent um, have the, something named after them. You know, I'm kind of in favor of the Sanford solar panels <laughs> or the, the garden would be just an amazing honor uh, as well. Or maybe we could get a list uh, out to the public of possibilities um, and, um, and maybe a list of what buildings are named of, you know, the bell tower, um, anything else throughout the community that is named, you know, for the community to ponder about uh, what, you know, we would help us come to a consensus about what would be a great fitting tribute to Betty Sanford and very fitting. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Next, I'd like to call Deborah Elliott Penzer. Good evening, board. Good evening, Superintendent Ryan Smith. Um, again, we know why we're here. Um, when this building was named in 2009 after Dr. Louise Taylor, it was bordered on by the board. Oh, let me just start by saying this. Rob Hammond, I'd like to thank you for pulling this agenda item. And Celine Lockerbie, I'd like to thank you for letting us speak on this item. Um, in 2009, it was voted on by the board. And at that time, it had to have three readings of the board to pass. So, you know, if somebody was opposed, then the majority voted and it was put into place. Now, was she well-deserving? Yes, well-deserving. And it was over 30 years of um, employment here with the district as a superintendent um, that she gave. And she was in the performing arts and she still is here doing the performing arts. She was just at the gala three weeks ago her and her husband come back, they get a table, and the table is not gratis, they pay, they donate. They're top of the donor list on the performing arts. 
So I don't know why we would name something after somebody and then take it away. I mean, it's like, give it, like it's, it's a billboard out there and then we're gonna take it back. It's an honor to be na a building named after you. Just like the Don Montgomery Athletic Center, the Byron Greer Field, um, you know, Frank Johnson Library, and, and Rob brought up a couple others that I wasn't even aware of. Um, but I mean, I don't think it's right to take something away from somebody and give it to somebody else. Yes, is Betty well deserving? More deserving than anybody I know. And I've known, I knew her for many, many years. But we have other places that we could don't, you know, we could put her name on instead of taking it away from somebody else. And um, I just don't know where it came from, how it came about, but I, I don't feel that it's right. So again, thank you, Mr. Hammond, for pulling it. And um, I, I, I look forward to hearing why it came up and how it came up. Um, I mean, there's another issue too. There's a garden plaque in the garden at the high school named after um, a military person, Joseph Fonseca. Are we gonna change that too? I mean, you know, if we're not, we don't wanna name buildings after people and we don't wanna do it, then just make a board policy, we're not gonna do it. But don't take away an honor that we've already given to somebody. So I thank you for your time, and I have one other little comment. Um, as a board president of the Murray Schools Foundation, um, we are trying to put together a scholarship for another well-deserving um, employee, um, Mrs. Ann Battle. So if anybody would like to make a contributance to that, uh, please let me know, Monrovia Schools Foundation at, at gmail.com. And um, we would appreciate the donations. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else? Comments? There are none. Madam President, I have been asked by a member of the community to um, read the comment from um, Betty Sanford's daughter. May I do that on their behalf? Well, I would think point of order. I, I came prepared uh, for tonight, and we do have a board bylaw. And in our book bylaw, it does state that we can have the recipient tell us the name and that it would be in our reflected in our minutes, but we don't re do the reading. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> in accordance with our bylaw, mm -hmm. we can read the name of the correspondent, right? into the record so it's reflected in our minutes and we do not then read the actual statement because we have multiple ones of those that have been requested but we have a bylaw that we just voted upon oh in April it's bylaw 9323 and we just updated this April 12th 2023 so I can Name the person who has made a comment, who has written a comment, but the comment cannot be read. You can submit the comment to Ms. Becerra and it would be a part of our record. So I name the person, give Ms. Becerra the comment, and the comment is part of the record where? Minutes. In the minutes, so, it, so this comment will be in the minutes at our next board meeting. Yes, if you would, if, if I'm <clears throat> reading it wrong. And I'm not trying to be leaguer the point, I apologize. Yes. I just oh, of course not. It. Um, so, Board President Golar, just to clarify, uh, the board did indeed update its bylaw regarding this particular matter. And so public comment is to be submitted into the record by individuals that come before the board to submit public comment. In the past, the previous policy had been that a member could, or somebody could submit a public comment in writing, and then it would be stated that this person submitted a public comment, and the board would move on, and it would be reflected in the minutes that this person submitted something. However, that's not the current bylaw. The current bylaw is that public uh, comment that is brought before the board needs to be conducted here in the boardroom in person. That answer your question? No, so now I can say who sent it in, give it to 
um, Ms. Becerra, and it will be reflected in the next board meeting. So once again, to clarify the board bylaw, public comment is to be submitted to the board here in the boardroom in person at the, the lectern. So in this case, this person or this comment that you've received, uh, according to our bylaw. Betty Sanford's daughter. So according to the board's bylaw, so the comment that you've received from Betty Sanford's daughter technically wouldn't go into the record because the comment needs to be made here in person as part of public comment. And again, that is the board's bylaw that was approved last month. So that the person, the person needs to be here in person yes. or the comment needs to be read in person? Person submitting the comment to be in person. Okay. Can, can I add a, a suggestion for <laughs> President Golar? Had Ms. Lockerbie share that email with, with you as board president since you respond on behalf of the board? Can that be shared? Of course. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. And do, Ms. Becerra, you answered that question. There were no other cards submitted for items not on the agenda? There are none. Okay. Now we're at public comments for items on the open session agenda. There are, have? There, there are none. There are none. Okay. All righty, guys. We are now at staff presentations, dual immersion update. Dr. Francois and Dr. Giroux, I believe. Good evening, President Golar, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, members of the cabinet, members of the community. It's my pleasure to present an update about our dual language immersion programs. And this is an annual report provided to the board each spring. Uh, next slide, please. Tonight's presentation will provide a brief historical background, enrollment data, successes, opportunities, challenges, and next steps for our dual immersion programs. Next slide, thank you. This slide shows some of the key milestones in our dual immersion programs over the past 12 years. As we celebrated earlier this evening, our first cohort of students began in the Spanish dual immersion program at Monroe in the 2010-2011 school year. And in 2015, five years after the Spanish DI program began, the Mandarin dual immersion program launched at Plymouth. The Spanish DI program at Wild Rose began in the 2019-20 school year, and students there are currently in grades TK to third and the first Mandarin dual immersion cohort of students will matriculate to Monrovia High School in the 2024-25 school year. Next slide, please. Our dual immersion master plan follows the guiding principles for dual language education. It's a publication created by the Center for Applied Linguistics, and we strive towards four goals, bilingualism and biliteracy, multicultural appreciation, parent and family partnerships, and academic achievement. Next slide, please. This slide displays dual immersion enrollment data, which sheds light on the growth of our programs, as well as information about the makeup of our student population. So Plymouth's Mandarin DI program has continued to grow and is expected to continue growing over at least the next year. Monroe, with the most established DI program, has the largest group of students Wild Rose and Santa Fe have grown and are expected to continue growing as new cohorts are added to their schools. Our dual immersion programs are also attracting students to our district. Approximately 15% of our dual immersion population come from neighboring districts. We also know that many families who would have, who might have considered private school for their child chose to stay in MUSD specifically for our dual immersion programs. Next slide, please. Dual immersion students at Monrovia High School have the opportunity to participate in advanced language courses. And this slide shows the current course offerings in Spanish and in Mandarin. Next slide. Given the rigor of participating in a dual immersion program, we recognize the importance of acknowledging students along the path 
and encouraging them to continue language immersion. Students have the opportunity to earn two distinctions at each of their promotion ceremonies. Commitment distinctions are awarded to students for per persevering through the dual immersion program through to their culmination at their school level. Biliteracy attainment distinctions are awarded to students in fifth and eighth grade who demonstrate proficiency in both the target language and in English. And these awards provide a pathway to the prestigious California State Seal of Biliteracy, which students can earn in the 12th grade. Next slide. These next two slides provide information about how our dual immersion students are performing in English language arts and in math. And this slide shows the percent of students in each group that performed at or above the standard on the 2022 CASP English language arts exam. The graph shows the performance at each of the tested grade levels of the following student groups. Mandarin dual immersion, Spanish dual immersion, MUSD students, LA County, and California. Results for our dual immersion students have been consistently strong and research supports the academic benefits that dual immersion programs provide. Next slide, please. This slide shows the same information for results on the 2022 CASP math exams and achievement levels in math were similar to the results in English language arts, and our dual immersion students continued to perform well. Next slide. Achievement of our dual immersion students at the high school level can be reflected by, the, by success on the AP language exams and earning the California State Seal of Biliteracy. Of the graduating Spanish dual immersion cohort, 10 attempted and passed the AP Spanish language exam, and seven out of nine attempted and passed the Spanish literature exam. And 11 of the 18 students earned the prestigious California State Seal of Biliteracy. Next slide, please. As our dual immersion programs grow and evolve, some challenges have emerged. Both Monroe and Wildrose have small cohorts of students, especially in their English program, and in many cases, there is one English class at the grade level. This has led to difficulty in balancing classroom rosters and limitations on making adjustments. It also can leave the sole English teacher at a grade level without a colleague at the site to collaborate with. Recruiting Mandarin teachers has become more challenging with a limited pool of candidates and many new Mandarin programs launching in nearby districts. With Spanish dual immersion teachers spread across two elementary sites, it's been difficult to provide opportunities for professional development and teacher collaboration. Wild Rose has the unique challenge of supporting two signature programs, Spanish dual immersion and creative arts. While more materials have become available for Spanish dual immersion, the availability of supplemental Mandarin materials remains limited. Finally, when, when students fall behind in Mandarin and in Spanish, it can be a challenge to provide intervention in the target language. Our intervention programs primarily focus on support in English language arts and in math. I'll turn over the presentation to Dr. Francois, who will describe opportunities and next steps. So given the current reality and the challenges shared by my colleague, Dr. Jerome, we invite the board to envision a new concept, a new concept aimed at better meeting the needs of dual immersion students, staff members, and families with the arrival of a Monroe Spanish Dual Immersion Academy. With this concept, we would look to transition Monroe's offerings to Spanish dual immersion exclusively over time while transitioning other schools' dual immersion courses to Monroe as well. This will provide a great opportunity to, for sole marketing, for, for looking to entice those from other districts to come, as well as providing parents with an option, a, prefer, a preference for English-only instruction to consider other schools within our district. Transition could begin as early as 24-25. Next slide. Some of our immediate next steps is looking to offer the Apple assessment recently that the, the board um, gave us approval to move forward with, 
that will truly be able to let us know how our students are performing. Analyze those results as well. Looking to provide avenues to improve enrichment opportunities for dual immersion students, and also looking to provide additional professional development options for all dual immersion teachers. One of which happens locally um, every year, it's either typically in Anaheim or Long Beach, the Kabe Conference. We're looking to send our teachers there to learn best practices. And working in collaborative nature with our human resources department and looking at innovative ways to expand teacher recruitment efforts, particularly in the areas of Mandarin. We had a very um, productive meeting yesterday with our partners from Citrus College. And our last one aims at our high school in particular. So looking at ways to expand dual enrollment offerings um, through Citrus College at our high school. So that could look something like providing um, elective type of courses within a target language. It also could look at expanding word language offerings, two of which we talked about yesterday as a desire to look at American Sign Language as a particular course offering um, in our near future, as well as Japanese. Next slide. At this time, we would love to entertain any questions. Questions? Lockerbie? Thank you, Madam President. Thank you both for the comprehensive overview. Appreciate your time this evening. If Ms. Becerra, you could please turn to the DI Student Achievement 2022 ELA slide. I was wondering if you have, and if you don't have, if you could get for us, what I would like to see is the, a breakdown of the academic uh, demographics. And I'd like that to be a 3 through 12, because we have 12 now for a Spanish program, at least, correct? So a 3 through 12 cohort. The cohort, yes. So if we could, so we would have to go back, and if we could look at the cohort, not each grade individually, but third grade through 12th grade. Do you have that? I just want to make sure I know what you're at. So you, you're asking for um, the makeup of the cohort at each grade of our dual immersion students? Well, I'm looking for the academic demographic because what you have on this slide is the percent at or above. And I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think this is the cohort, right? Because this is 2022, so this is all of the grades individually Correct. for it's 2022. A snapshot. Ah. So what I'm interested in is, so we see the percent who are at or above, but the stati the hard data that we have access to starting from third grade is exceeds, meets, nearly meets, and doesn't meet the standards. So what I'm interested in seeing is with the cohort seeing the movement in, I, I guess I would be speaking yeah. about Spanish because Mandarin isn't as far. What I'm interested in seeing is the movement of, the academic movement of students who are not exceeding or have, who have not exceeded or met the standards. I'd love all of the demographics, but what I'm curious in is the people who are, uh, the students who are nearly met, or not met from three through 12 in the DI program, what's that movement? Because here we see the achieving students in this program. So what I'd like to see is what we are doing for those students who are not in this demographic. Um, and then if you are doing that, if you could um, provide it for us for as much as you have for the Mandarin students, and that would be, how far are we? We're to seventh grade for right. a Mandarin program. Yes. So if it could be three, three through seven for the Mandarin program, I would be very interested in seeing that. Okay, I'll get back to you on that. Yes. Thank you. 
um, we we this board, the previous board, has had this question for a long time. Um, do you know what happens to math in eleventh grade? <laughs> I'll just. Um, yeah, I, I know that it's a state trend, you know, but I'm, I'm sure there are factors that would explain that. I, I don't have a specific answer for that particular group of students, but we know that it is. Well, and we can of, see that there's the state and the county here also, mm -hmm. and as you said, it is a trend. Um, so do you know if currently in both of the DI programs, if we teach math in the foreign language. So in the case of the Spanish dual immersion program, as a 90-10 program, math is taught in Spanish in the target language um, at least the first three or four years. I think by fourth and fifth grade, they might um, it becomes more of a 50-50 program. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, they might separate and more of that's, I think it's taught in the English portion of their day. In the Mandarin program, it's a 50-50 program from the start, and so the English teacher teaches math, and the Mandarin teacher supports that content and learning. But since they're just learning basic vocabulary, it wouldn't, they're not, they don't have access to the content or the understanding of, of math in that same way. So math in the Mandarin program, you believe, is not taught in Mandarin. I'm sorry, did I say that? Math in the Mandarin program is taught in English. I see nodding. Yeah, I can confirm in the Mandarin program, math is taught in English. It's supported in the Mandarin part of the day, but it's primarily taught in English. Okay. Um, I'm just curious if these scores have anything to do with that, these math scores uh, that I'm looking at. Do you, is that something that is, is that data that you can research? So um, I, luckily there, there's a lot of research about the different models of dual immersion and one of the aspects of a 90-10 model, which is what our Spanish program is, is that it can take longer for students to catch up because 90% of their day is in the target language, but um, they almost, they usually will not just meet the standard but surpass um, that after a number of years. So that's something that they found throughout programs across the country. The 9010 model has its strengths, but if there is a disadvantage, it might take a little bit longer for the students to catch up. Um, the same has been said about 50-50 programs, but they're also very different populations and groups, and there's some, of the, some of the cohorts are small, so even a few students can make a big difference. Um, Appreciate that. I'd like to add to that. Um, I think I would also be cautious with how we interpret the test scores from 2022 in general. Um, please remember that this 22 was a, or 21-22 was a more normal school year than 2021, obviously. Um, but there was quite a bit of impact on testing and things like that, and I'd also look at 11th grade results, whether it's English or math, with um, caution considering that. Uh, the other thing that is an important contextual piece is that once students get into high school, they're only tested at one grade level. And so part of the reason that we're looking at assessment in general is to try to identify what are some other assessments we can have that fill in some of those gaps. And that's one reason, for example, this year why we implemented iReady, but we also implemented uh, the map growth assessments, at least started a pilot with that for that very reason. But looking at 2022 as one single snapshot of data um, is very difficult to interpret especially for the older range of students. But as you can see, for the younger range of students that are more in their initial journeys and our grade levels and things like that, the results are pretty promising. And as I mentioned previously, um, we have long had questions. We've long seen a dip in the math scores um, in 11th grade, so it's it's, still a question 
it's still an unanswered question for me, at least. So, um, <laughs> I, 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 it, it looks like it's a quandary for everybody. So, um, and and I appreciate that. Um, and it's just um, interesting to to look at, and and um, I look forward to more information as you do more investigation about that. I was wondering, we have in our district a 90-10 and a 50-50 in two different languages. Are there any other models out there that are like 80-20 um, or 70-30? Not that I'm aware of. The two model, every conference I've been to, those are the two models that have been presented. Okay. Um, and then my final question, the um, penultimate slide for next steps, sorry, not my final question, um, but that um, second to the last, that last bullet point that says, pursue dual enroll enrollment course offering opportunities with Citrus. I apologize for not understanding. Do you mean dual enrollment, the college dual enrollment? Yes, indeed. So what this would, what this, what this would mean would be a college course offering on our very campus. So a college course offering taught by staff, faculty from Citrus College to our existing Monrovia High School students. I'm sorry for still not understanding, but we have dual we have a dual in, uh, dual enrollment program that's ongoing. This is in the DI program next steps. Are you, and I don't understand was dual enrollment was DI not in the dual enrollment? I don't understand the the marriage there. Definitely. So what it does is it provides. Um, an additional, a potential additional course. So for instance, um, we look at okay. in high school, the limited offerings we have with dual immersion. However, say for instance, we had a, a college level elective course in that target language, whether it's in Mandarin or in Spanish, um, could be very enticing for students to take. Another way for them to get a grasp of a college level rigor early on. And this could be something that could be offered in the fall after school, spring after school, also during the summer. So it's something not part of the early college, but it is a partnership with Citrus that would include um, another language. Correct, and open for, for all interested students. Thank you for, the, for clarifying that. I'm sorry I was, I was a little opaque there. Um, when you have mentioned some considerations in turning Monroe into a Spanish Dual Immersion Academy, what would that look like for the neighborhood students that live right there that aren't interested in being in the Spanish program? Where would you, where would we potentially, how are you thinking, where would we send them? How would we get them there? Um, what would busing look like if that was a necessity? Do you have some ideas on what that looks like for neighborhood families? Definitely. So it'll be something that will be, you know, thought of with, with a lot of different stakeholders in, in mind. So a lot of people sitting at the table. So ultimately, the, the idea would be for those English-only uh, preferred families that they would have a choice. And the great thing with our district, our schools are within pretty close proximity towards one another. So that would be something that we would, we would look at with the team. And some might be looking at which one is closest proximity, or some might be attracted to some of the other offerings or specialties that our elementary schools do offer. So that would be under consideration as well. Uh, thank you for that. So they are in close proximity, but busing might be a, a situation. Then would that have to be um, part of the consideration? Oh, absolutely. So that will be definitely something that we would definitely look to consider. Um, transportation as well as um, all types of, of needs as well. Thank you. Those are all of my questions. Pravanti. Uh, Thank you, President Gohler. Um, Ms. Lockerbie just asked one of the questions that I was going to ask is in regards to transportation and how we 
move kids around if those that need to um, if we go this route the other um, item I have been told that the DI in Spanish is really just through middle school not high school so for those students that are in high school taking Spanish courses how does this work for them how can you go into a little more detail on the literacy seal and then um, what was the other one yeah the DI students earning the seals so how does that work so um, dual immersion at the high school does look different and I've um, I've learned from other districts at different uh, dual immersion conferences so it, it changes at each stage. So at the high school, what we've seen in other districts also is students have opportunities to take advanced language courses um, or perhaps a dual enrollment in a college course. Um, but it's more of a it's there are, it's more of providing them with options to continue advancing their language learning, not so much a precise or set course or pathway that they would follow. But that state seal of biliteracy is kind of an ultimate culminating event that we would encourage that we would encourage and students are encouraged to apply for that along with AP exams I see so they they need to actually apply for that uh, they, if they reach a certain level in Spanish they would apply for the state seal of biliteracy yes uh, there are certain requirements okay. um, so I think I believe the counselors someone with more secondary information would know but yeah okay yeah okay. yes that's that's correct you don't apply for the state seal of biliteracy uh, there's a review of oh. the criteria mm -hmm. and if you qualify then you qualify all yeah, right. there, there's and no that's working with the school process. counselor then okay correct all right thank you those were my two thank you thank you very much um, along the lines of sort of changing the um, sizing or or format at a school um, also deals with space and the configurations um, I know at one point Monroe was a smaller school and then it became the largest school I believe for a while it was sort of bursting at the seams and and we um, had it overflow to Wild Rose to accommodate the need uh, do you anticipate if we were to move forward with a, a Monrovia, uh, sorry, a Monroe Academy for dual immersion, uh, that we would have the sufficient space to accommodate all students that were interested in, in partaking of this opportunity? So um, <clears throat> the, the interesting thing is that we looked at the number of students in the English program at Monroe is approximately 150, 155 and it's about the same number at Wild Rose who are in the Spanish dual immersion program currently. So it's, an, it's a surprisingly similar size of students. Um, however, of course, every, it might fluctuate. Sure. Um, so it could, but when Monroe was bursting at the seams, that's when it was housing both programs. Um, so part of the idea is by focusing on, one, on just the dual immersion, they're more likely to be able to house those students um, or it's the, than they would have been in the past. So that makes sense. I just, uh, you know, not knowing what the the trend in interest is over the years, um, if if we would anticipate surpassing the the capacity, um, this is going to sound like a dumb question, but does that change our staffing needs significantly? Because it it sounds like it would just be oh, just move people around. But given that these staff members have very dynamic and often unique um, teaching assignments given the multiple roles that they play. Is, is it as simple as just saying, we need to take this group of, of teachers and put them at this site and this group of teachers back over at this site uh, to accommodate, or would we need, would it be more complicated than that? I think it would be more complicated. I'm not sure how complicated, but and I think a similar um, situation when the program began at Wild Rose, there was some shifting of staffing, and it wasn't. It, sometimes it was very straightforward and simple, and other times we had to kind of think it through. So I would, I it would be something I would 
think that we would spend some time making sure we're doing it the right way and, and um, working alongside with MTA as well. Okay, great. Thank you. And just just to make sure I'm understanding this, we're talking about dual immersion Spanish only? Okay. I just wanted to clarify that, that we're, we're just talking about the Spanish piece and that the Mandarin um, is is being maintained at Plymouth with this with this suggestion. Yes. Um, last is just a comment, and uh, I'm just I'm so pleased to see, much like I think music, it appears that learning a different language really does inspire our children to to achieve um, at greater levels with the the English and math scores being so much higher than than the um, the counterparts. So that's thank you for sharing that with us. Mr. Hammond, did you have a question or so? I'm, You're good? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I just, you know, I, I had an ask. Um, is that something that you can give us yes. um, at an upcoming board report? I know sifting through data it is daunting, so... Not However, I will, you know, I, will I, I understand it, it takes a while. I won't expect it uh, to us by next Friday, and I appreciate your time. But if you, I just wanted to make sure that we were able to get that Absolutely. information. Thank you. And as we transition, I, I do need to acknowledge that both principals from Wild Rose Creative School of the Arts and Monroe uh, principals are, are seated. And... Algin was here earlier from Plymouth, but I, I, I want to acknowledge that they have sat in our board meeting because I believe probably this, this topic was being discussed. So thank you for being here. Okay, uh, consent agenda. Routine items of business placed on the consent agenda have been carefully screened by members of the staff and will be acted upon by the board with one motion. Upon request of any person, any item in the consent agenda may be considered separately at its location on the meeting's agenda. Do we have any items that are needing to be looked at separately? There are none. And do we have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second, and any discussion? Okay, and we can call for a vote, please, Ms. Becerra. Board Member Chavanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Um, there is an item on here that um, I had some more questions about, and um, I think instead of um, pulling it, um, I think the best course of action for me is to abstain. Board President Golar? Yes. Motion carries four and one abstention. Okay. We're now at our action items. And our first action item is in... The Educational Services Department. So again, Dr. Francois, um, you want to present for us, um, what is this? Agency Affiliation Agreement with the University of Denver, Oak Ridge College of Education. The Board of Education is requested to approve an agency affiliation agreement between the University of Denver, Oak Ridge College of Education, and Monrovia Unified School District. Monrovia Unified School District would like to utilize graduate students from the Masters of School Counseling Program, University of Denver Mortgage College of Education for field work consisting of group counseling, academic planning, advising, career counseling, crisis intervention, and, as and assessment. The graduate students will acquire on-the-job training and experience through this field work and will be supervised by MUSD school counselors. There are questions or clarifications? Motion for approval? So, so moved. moved. Second. And we'll call it to a vote. Board Member Hammond? 
Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Chavanti? Yes. Board President Golar? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. And now we have business services, um, Assistant Super Business Services, Jessica Garcia. We have food catering agreement, cup of chai, tea, chai? Cha? Cha. And I drink chai, but yeah. cha, tea house. There you go. Thank you, President Golar. The Board of Education is requested to approve a food catering agreement with Cup of Cha Tea House for a spring event at Plymouth Elementary School in the Monrovia Unified School District. Approval of this agreement will allow Cup of Cha Tea House to participate in Plymouth Elementary School events and fundraising activities, as well as on other campuses as needed. Plymouth Elementary School is hosting a spring event on Friday, May 12, 2023. Once the Board approves this agreement, it will allow Cup of Cha House Cup of Cha Tea House to participate in events and fundraising activities on other campuses as needed. Questions, clarifications? Okay. And we'll call for a vote. Or so moved. Second. I'm right. the motion. We are motion. We, 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 we did you, it. You guys we did are care of it. <laughs> we got the motion. We got the second. We now knew what she meant. we'll call for the vote. Thank you. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Chavanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board President Golar? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Assistant Soup of HR, Dr. Puccia. Resolution recognizing May 21st to the 27th, 2023, as Classified School Employee Week. The Board of Education is requested to adopt Resolution 2223-27, declaring May 21st, the 27th, 2023, as Classified Employee Week, and urges all citizens to participate in observations that express their appreciation for classified employees. The re resolution well provides well-deserved recognition and appreciation of classified school employees for the contributions and support services they provide in our schools. Each May, California salutes the important contributions of classified school employees during classified school employee week. Questions, clarifications? None. Motion. So moved. Go ahead. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second, and we'll call for the vote. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board Member Chavanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board President Golar? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. And Dr. Pachia, we have another a revision of the resolution 2223-21, recognizing May 8th through the 12th, 2023, as National Teacher Appreciation Week, and May 9th, 2023, as National Day of the Teacher. The Board of Education is requested to adopt the revision of resolution number 2223-21, correcting the recognition dates to align with the state and national and declaring May, I'm sorry, nation and declaring May 9th, 2023 as National Day of the Teacher and May 8th through the 12th, 2023 as National Teacher Appreciation Week and urges all citizens to participate in the observ observance that express their appreciation for teachers. Monrovia Unified School District recognizes the commitment, dedication, and excellence our teachers provide our students and the greater community. Teachers deserve tremendous credit and recognition for the outstanding traditional and non-traditional educational programs they provide for students throughout the district. Questions? Comments? I yes. have a comment, President Golar. I've been seeing all the celebrations on social media this week, and I want to say a special shout out to all our PTAs, PTSAs, um, and community members that have joined in this week to create these wonderful celebrations for our teachers. So shout out to them as well. Thank you. Okay. And we'll have a motion for approval. So moved. Second. And we'll call the vote. Board Member Chavanti? Yes. Board Member Hammond? 
Yes. Board Member Anderson? Yes. Board Member Lockerbie? Yes. Board President Golar? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. And we are now at our information item. Board Policy 5146, Married Pregnant Parenting Students. There is a second one, um, Board Bylaw 9125, Legal Counsel. Any need for clarification, questions, comments? Okay. It has been our practice if we have no further need of uh, questions or comments or clarifications that these come back to us in consent. Is that the will of the board? We have consensus agreement on that? Mr. Yes. Hammond? Yes? Okay. So, Superintendent Smith, we'll do that with these two items. Okay. Uh, May 24th, 6.30 will be our regular Board of Education meeting. June 14th, also a regular Board of Education meeting, as well as June the 28th. We have a couple of events coming up. The Superstars of Music. Well... We still have um, Superstars of Music on May the 16th at uh, 6 o'clock at the Louise K. Taylor Performing Arts Center at MHS. Monrovia Days begin May the 19th and go through that weekend of the, until the 21st in our library park. And then we have our upcoming graduation and promotional ceremonies it, it seems that each of the elementary school, all five of them, are scheduled for Wednesday the 7th at anywhere starting 8.10 to the last one starting at uh, 9 o'clock. So within that window, all five of the elementary schools will have their promotion ceremony. And then our two middle schools, Clifton Middle School and Santa Fe Computer Science Magnet School, will have their promotional ceremonies both on June the 6th. And Clifton is at 9 a.m. and Santa Fe is at 8.30 a.m. We have the Canyon Oaks Mountain Park School on Tuesday also, June the 6th, that evening at 6 p.m. Monrovia High School will have its graduation Wednesday the 7th uh, of June at 5 p.m., obviously, Wildcat Field, right? MHS. And then we have, in the month of May, the Monrovia Community Adult School graduation, which is Thursday, May the 25th. And that one is at 6 p.m. Okay? So an interesting ordering, but that covers all of our promotion and graduation uh, ceremonies. Before we close tonight, we would like to close the meeting in memory of three special individuals. And we have broken up um, each of these. First, we'll recognize Christy Kim, teacher at Plymouth Elementary from 1997 until 2021. Christy passed away on May the 2nd, 2023. Jennifer Malgen, principal of Plymouth Elementary, had this to say about Mrs. Kim. Christy Kim was an exceptional human being, a teacher who was not only dedicated to her profession, but who also touched the lives of so many with her kindness, love, and faithfulness. She was more than just a teacher. She was a friend, a mentor, a confidant, a role model. Her classroom was a place where students felt safe, valued, and loved. She had a remarkable ability to connect with her students, to see them as individuals, and to understand their unique strengths and challenges. We're grateful for the time we had with her and we will carry her memory with us always. Dear friend, you will be deeply missed but never forgotten. She is survived by her husband, James Kim, and her children, Jordan, Harper, and Christian Kim. Next, we would like to remember Kathleen Jean Gregorio science and math teacher at Santa Fe Middle School from 1998 until her retirement in 2016. 
Her coworker and, da- and friend Dave Hart had this to say about her. Tonight we mourn the passing of a beautiful individual who spent several years teaching students at Santa Fe Middle School. Kathy Jean Gregorio was simply known as Miss G. She was known for her bubbly personality and deep concern not only for the education of her students, but their well-being. Music was her passion, only exceeded by the connection with students and staff. She was loved by all. Rest in peace, Miss G. And on a personal note, my students were there when Miss G was a teacher. And while they never had her, we all knew who she was because she made such an impact on students throughout the campus. It didn't matter if you were in her class or not. Finally, we would like to remember Gabrielle Gabe Romero, warehouse employee from 2008 until 2022, who passed away on May 3rd, 2023. His former co-workers had this to say about him. Gabe was the ultimate team player and best co-worker. He was a hard worker who greeted everyone with a kind word and a smile. Gabe had a lot of love for his family and his two dogs, Grayson and Stella. Gabriel will be missed by the Monrovia team. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Kim, Gian Gregorio, and Romero families at this time. With that, I would like to adjourn our open session meeting at 8.31.